One, two. Quite a lot has been made recently of your sort of interest in the modern classical world, the music machine, got Carl Heinz Stockhausen to listen to some of your music. Are you actually interested in contemporary classical music? Yeah, and um, that was really wicked, really enjoyed that. What a sort of big fan of scraping that. So what, what about the business with Stockhausen recently? What did you make of all that? Well, I was just sort of game to sort of, I don't know what the sort of programme was, you know, what they wanted to do kind of thing, but I was sort of into it. I suppose the, the idea was that lots of people like yourself name check people like Stockhausen and contemporary classical composers, and they wanted to see what people like Stockhausen thought of it. Um, and did, do you actually know what he thought of your work? Yeah, I sort of heard a few comments and stuff, which were sort of quite funny, but I sort of, you know, it was a bit disappointing because I sort of could have predicted what he said anyway, kind of thing. What so, did he say? Um, you know, just sort of, you know, sort of arrogant attitude kind of thing. It's just what I probably thought he'd say. You've always got to listen to me carefully enough. Yeah, because I think they were trying to make out it was, you know, the world of techno being influenced by Stockhouse and things. I don't think it has at all, because I don't reckon 99% of sort of techno vibes have, you know, really have ever heard of him, so. It seems to me the only similarity is it's electronic. And yeah. it sort of ends there. Yeah, it's just like a parallel sort of world, really. You know, I don't think it really anything to do with techno. The interesting thing is, though, that the people who, who listen to, to your kind of music are now starting to listen to Zanarchus and Stockhouse, and so that that's really the overlap. I think it's interesting on the part of the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they're both sort of sonically interesting, I suppose. So, you know, it's a sort of common ground for me, isn't it? When you listen to things like that, do you put them in a historical perspective? Do you um, think of how, I wonder how he did that. Yeah, but there's, it reminded me a bit of um, Forbidden Planet a little bit. Um, that was done in the 50s, and that's better than that, I think, for um, sort of electronic type stuff. So what's what's the 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 the
surprised by how much your music and your sound has taken off. I mean, you remixed one of your tracks with Philip Glass recently, and that must be something an accolade to you. Yeah, sort of 50% of me sort of surprised, and the other 50% think it's normal kind of thing. <laughs> how does it work for you know, when you did your Philip Glass? Um, just got in touch with him and thought, you know, sort of was into orchestrating it in my track. Um, and he sort of sent back a demo which I thought was rubbish. And, you know, so I didn't like it and stuff. And he was seemed to be quite offended and sort of went away and did something else. And I thought that was really good. And I sort of ended up going over and finishing it off to him. You know, I just ended up telling him how I wanted him to play things and stuff. Because presumably, most of the time, if not all the time, in the past, you've been working on your own. So this was the first time you actually had to go out there and. Yeah, I mean, usually I'll just, you know, if I want to change something, I'll just still do a novel press button. So it's quite weird, you know, for us to talk to people. One, two. Hello, everyone. Well, very, very loud. <laughs> okay, hello, everyone. My name is Nadia. I'm the coordinator of this space. This is a laboratory for prototyping future cities, Shuha Lab of the HEC Graduate School of Urbanism. And um, we are having today um, a beginning of the series of lectures, actually, Shukhov Lab. You can see, okay, you, you cannot see already. Ivan, please, for one second back. <laughs> yeah. We are starting the series of lectures today about city, technology, urbanism, construction, and we are going to have the great speakers with us during the next months. So if you're interested to join to the series of lectures, please follow our social media, Facebook or Instagram. And we are starting today with Alexander Dubor, who came from Spain. Or maybe not. <laughs> and um, uh, from the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. And uh, we are having the first topic connected with construction, with robotics, which also one of the agenda of our laboratories. And for us, is really interesting as and is really very important to understand how this sphere is developing all over the world. And Alexander is one of the representatives of this international community of makers and and uh, people who are making the new technologies, new materials for construction. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting. Um, just one point, um, I'm French and maybe my accent is a bit strong, so don't hesitate to stop me uh, if you don't understand something. I will try to articulate really well. Um, also, um, I can speak a lot, but I don't like so much. I prefer to have um, it a change and that we become a discussion. 
So if at one point you don't understand something or you want more information about something, I'm more than happy to stop and to speak about it or to find some other slides or video. We have plenty of them. Um, also one important thing, um, I'm coming from this uh, institute that is called IAC, but I'm not the only one behind this project, there's many people behind it. Uh, we are more than 100 people, uh, 150 students and 60 staff uh, trying to push the boundaries of uh, what we imagine uh, the future of our cities. So uh, I cannot summarize it in one hour um, and I'm just focusing on a global aspect of uh, what we're trying to do uh, in Ajax and specifically how um, a challenge uh, could be solved with robotics and advancing constructions. So that's a bit of an overview. Um, so thank you very much uh, to Shukovlav to invite me to speak here today. I'm really happy to be here in uh, Moscow. Also happy to see uh, the great jobs that have been done in the past years here. Uh, so congrats, I was seeing a bit of the video there. Uh, interesting. Um, okay, just a bit of context maybe. Um, so one thing that we have in um, in Spain, and I think it's a representative in the rest of the world, uh, we have kind of crazy buildings going on uh, with quite advanced technology to make such building. Um, while maybe the effect Bilbao, the wow effect of the building, uh, some might like it, uh, what we try to look at is how this technology cannot just do shape for the pleasure of shapes or for the aesthetic of it, but also have a function, a performance, and can be actually solving all the problems. Uh, that we are facing. Um, there is actually quite a lot of um, uh, example of crazy architectures um, trying to push the boundaries of what could be done uh, with these technologies. Um, and we clearly see a new potential in, um, in what could be done. Um, there been some intent in trying to find uh, performative facades, structures that are quite efficient, uh, try to tune to each program. Uh, this is one of the teachers of the school um, that is, uh, have done this uh, gigantic building in Barcelona. So there's actually people willing to see in architecture uh, some innovation and some changes. Uh, what we try to say is that it can go beyond this publicity of innovation or this publicity of uh, new uh, architectures, um, but it could also have a positive impact. Um, actually, on the world, there's uh, quite a need for um, better constructions. Um, first, as um, places that are actually nice for living in it. Um, we have a lot of people that are still lacking adequate housings, and it's not a small numbers, 1.6 billion people. Uh, we are looking at a huge part of the population according to uh, UN Habitat. Um, there's also a lack of constructing more houses. Um, maybe in Moscow you start to have a boom about this. In Europe it's not so strong as we imagine, but actually it's also happening in Europe. Uh, but in Asia, Africa, there's actually many, many, many uh, cubic meters of concrete and construction happenings. And this is have a global impact. Actually, if you think about it, um, we need to build a lot, quite fast, but also we have to think that this have a huge impact on the planet. Actually, the building itself consumes a lot of energy, and we should be able to reduce the impact in terms of consumption, so design better or more integrated into the environment. Also, one of the key aspects, um, and I don't have the right number here on the screen, um, a lot of uh, CO2 is released in the air just by constructing buildings. We actually pollute a lot by fabricating the building. If you think about it, each ton of CO2, of uh, concrete we're putting in a building, we release one ton of CO2 in the air. And buildings are not really lightweight. As you can imagine, we are quite polluting a lot, the planet, uh, with concrete. So we have to look at alternatives. We know there's potentials, but we have to promote innovation in these fields and try to change a bit how it's happening. That's a bit uh, how we imagine. One of the aspects we would like to also focus is the fact that um, in our society we don't necessarily want standardized building. Maybe we could solve some of this issue by mass production and trying to be in the efficient side of the world. Um, as architects, we also look at the fact that um, there's potential for um, using this technology uh, to adapt the building uh, to new conditions. Each city is different in its culture, in its environment. Each building have um, specific needs and we cannot have a standard solution for any architecture. So we believe there should be a customized solution for each project and the means of production of such projects should be customized as well. So we need more flexible uh, 
production systems, we need more flexible design, and we should be able to handle all this complexity that is asked in the building to be handled as well in the way it's produced. With this in mind, I just want to quickly show what is IAC. Um, it's actually a center, a research center in education, created to research on the advances of architectures and how we can push it further. And I think it's a bit like the same as Shukov Lab. We don't know exactly what will come out from it, but we push for merging many um, uh, disciplines together. So what we look, it's kind of a, um, a, a, an approach that look at different scale of the building. So from um, the really matter of the building up to the urban scale, looking at how we materialize things as well as softwares and interaction and application. So there's many aspects that we look in, and now we'll just focus on uh, what we could do as materializing ideas. Well, I will speak a bit uh, fast on these topics, but there's not only uh, research, education, development, promotion, all this is part actually of making innovation works. And the same happened here, I think, in, uh, in this place. It's not just about researching, it's also having sure that people know how to push it further, how to uh, have more people convinced and um, and try to develop it into a real project. Um, one of the key aspects here, and this is where we meet quite well with all the Fab Lab networks. I don't know if you're all aware of this, but here I think that you're also part of this uh, Fab Lab networks. Um, and there is also this will of merging um, a bit tools and technology to make um, our space a better world. And this is actually super important for us because we are not disconnecting what is digital and physical. We are merging both of them in one world. Um, and one of the key aspects of the Fab Lab is not so much about the tools, it's more about the knowledge that you can share between peoples and how this spread over the world. I don't know if you know it, but Fab Labs, um, 10 years ago it was only maybe 50 labs. Now we have more than 1,500 labs in the world. Um, and it's not the franchise or a way of saying like, this is our mark or our trade, um, is about saying that we are all together willing uh, to push technology in a better world. And it's not only about cities, it could be about all the aspects of our life, from clothing to uh, product design, there's many aspects of it. Um, one thing that is quite interesting is to understand in our context uh, what's happening and why this is changing for us. Now, what, what is the, 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 the new why this technology is changing so much and why we didn't see so much change before. So we have to think that always architectures and cities have evolved with the technology that we've been developing. But one thing that is key um, is that now we are getting it more and more close to um, computers and software. So one of the key aspects here is that it's more than 60 years that, uh, or 70s that actually this technology exists. Um, but now it started to be more integrated. It started to help us to connect more between us and we're able to make integrated design with all the people involved. We're not anymore only alone in our computers, but we're able to communicate with all the disciplines that are around the building industry. So that's why the BIM world, even if we're not so fan of the software that are around for now, they have a dream of connecting all these people together. And this is what we um, use um, as an example of how software can push the boundaries um, of our uh, design, let's say. One thing that you have to imagine, uh, this is an example of a project that was done uh, in 95 uh, by Frank Gehry. It's a fish uh, that have been done in uh, Barcelona. It's actually a sculpture, but it's the size of a building. And it's been from the ID to the fabrication, only three months happening. He had only three months to make this project. And that's the first time, actually, an architect used an engineering software that was normally for the aerospatial industry, where they could actually go from design to fabrication in a really linked process. So you shortcut totally the time, and you can integrate much better the constraint of fabrication into your design. And this is huge. In construction, normally you have design, then there's someone that's going to the detailing, and then in the construction, there's a market call, and then your project is starting to be built. But if you want to change something or to influence your design with it, it's generally too late. You cannot come back in your project. So you cannot integrate all the layer of complexity of the building in your design. You have to skip half of it or most of it to be able to focus on only certain aspects. So suddenly you have something you can move on at all the layers. Another aspect that is quite important um, in, uh, in the way we handle this software, today we are much more comfortable with it. We're not um, just using a software, but we're able to program our own software, our own code, our own shapes, 
And we are not anymore um, looking only at the geometry, but we are looking at logics. We're able to program our own logic, to design logics that connect functions, IDs into something. For example, today we don't build anymore, we don't design anymore the detail of a uh, windows. We'll define a logic to fill a frame, and then this frame can change and the logic will adapt to it. And certainly my facade is not any more exposed to the north facade, but to the south. And you can embed into your logic that this will change. So certainly if you have, for example, a round building, you could have a variation over all these aspects. So you can certainly use IDs and principles from one building to another one. You can share between everybody. And you can embed much more complexity into it, because you can stratify many layers of IDs and combinations. So that's quite important for us as well. On the other side, the machines are also uh, getting more and more uh, common. Um, so that's also, oops, uh, that's also something that evolve. Um, finally, is quite old when you think about it. It's more than 40 years old of um, CNC machine or digitally controlled machines. Um, but still, um, we are just recently starting to use it. One of the big changes is that actually we have access to it. It's much more easy to use it and to exploit all of the information behind. Um, so laser cutting, CNC machine, 3D printing, robotic arm, are many aspects of it. There's a thousand more, but actually this summarizes quite well different approach to digital fabrications. And I think some of them you have here, um, and there's quite a potential. Just to remember, um, the um, robotic arm is not so far from other um, uh, fabrication methods. It's control CNC, uh, it's, um, numerically controlled movement with the end effector that is laser cutting or milling at the end of it. It's just about how we push it. But one thing that is really key to the robotic arm is that it's a flexible machine. You can use it in many uh, different applications. And actually, we have industry starting to contact us to replace their huge machinery of more than 2 million euros with more simple system like this one. Because like this, they can tune the fabrication process to each project. So they will use it for one project in a way, and then the next six months, they will use it to another project. And they can change much more easily the system of fabrication. So this brings more flexibility in your fabrication systems. Another quite important point, um, all this technology are coming in the market or coming into the industries in our environment. And it's not that um, I'm promoting the fact that we need to have more robots. It's just a fact. It will happen. I can't be quite sure about this. I'm kind of a fan of more this philosophy of accelerationist to accept the fact that this technology are coming into our life actually much faster than we can apprehend it. And what we need to do is to understand what is the potential of these things. And instead of trying to sell more robots, it's just about looking at how in the future, when this robot will be in place, how we can use it in the best, the most clever way. And I think it's something we should, should face with technology. All the technology I will show you or we've been working with actually exists for a long time around. It's just about combining it in a clever way and to move it, move it forward. And there's many more to come. So here the data are showing some things uh, that are normally for um, actually logistic. It's not for construction industry. Um, so the price here, the, they say that basically the difference between asking humans or robots to make logistic into warehouse is now at the limit. Um, and actually, that's why Amazon is making much more robots into logistics and things like this. Um, in the world of construction, this date might be much further, 2025, 2030. For sure, it will be later, but it will happen. Question is when. And the same with the city, how much we will have to wait to see automated care in the street. It's just a question of time. It's not a doubt. It will happen. So we have to think a bit in this way, I think. Another model, um, this maybe is not so sure it will happen, but we are pushing a lot, uh, is to think a different economic model. Um, I think we've been a lot into a linear process of fabrication. And nowadays, matter is moving all over the planet. We have something that doesn't stay um, uh, normally local. When you think about what you have in your pocket, your phone, tends to come from more than 20 different countries. There's mostly all the materials that we know in the table of, uh, uh, of uh, base materials. Um, and it's quite amazing how they travel all over the planet to be manufactured finally in China, come back to Russia, and then after one year of use, we trash it again. And it travels all over the way, again, either in Africa or other places, South, uh, South um, America, to be recycled. 
What we believe, and we're not the only one, there's a potential um, to rethink this linear economy into something that is more circular. So we have to rethink a bit the material, we have to rethink the process to be able to go with the matter and to be able to use it much more locally. More than the energy that is um, used for traveling all over the planet, the interesting bit here is to think that we can find local solutions that are adapted to the material I can find, the process we are used to, and what is the need that they have. What we believe um, is to we can go from a city where we have the product in and the trash out, where we just product, produce trash, to a city where the things will flow in a way that actually stay within the city, the material will stay there, and what is sharing over the cities is people and ideas. So it's just about knowledge sharing. So data in, data out. So this model is what we believe around the fab city. And these have different scale of applications. Um, this, um, if you want to have more information, you can look at the fab city research labs. They have a lot of uh, investigation into this. If you look at the question of construction, you have to think that um, we don't believe necessarily that fab lab of small scale industries would be able to make um, local economy, maybe we'll have to look at the bigger industry at the scale of the city, of the region, for the buildings. It might be difficult to produce a building out of these labs, but it's not impossible. So what we're looking a lot is about these ideas of Industry 4.0. Do you know Industry 4.0? This is some hand shaking, maybe, no? Yeah? <laughs> Sounds to you? So. In all the um, industries, uh, especially the one looking at innovations, not necessarily in constructions, um, there's a lot of um, thinking that they are in the fourth industrial revolutions. Um, maybe it's a bit of commercials to try to sell more robots and more sensors, but it's quite interesting to see the shifts that they're proposing. They're proposing that actually, after the computer and automation that actually didn't happen in the construction sectors, we are moving to a new era where we have cyber physical systems. What this means? This means that we can use more sensors, more simulations, more advances in materials and processes, and try to combine the world of digital and the world of physical into one system. So we don't separate the two things. And it's not from the digital to the physical, but there's a feedback loop. And this is a bit something that have been developed a lot in this kind of labs. How we can scan and get information from the reality, use it in the digital world, and re-influence the physical world. So these feedback loops. And so they are looking at this at a really high level into industries, but we can also look at it into design. And this is what I will try to show you um, in a couple of slides. If you want to have more information, this is Wikipedia. <laughs> I didn't do that. Um, but actually, it's a really big move happening now in industries. It will happen quite soon in all the car industries, the aeronautics, and things like this. And we believe that construction uh, will use it uh, for a reason, is that this was for mass production. Still, you will mass produce it. But here we start to go to more uh, customized uh, productions that can recognize the materials that they're using and getting into it. Okay, maybe to go a bit into projects to be a bit more, um, let's say, and touching something. No, it's a bit uh, abstract now. Um, I will start with some simple projects. Um, if you think about it in the um, um, in the way we can produce architecture or like a design interior space. This was a project that uh, we've been asked from a um, restaurant close to us to try to produce an open source uh, restaurant from the design interiors, from the chairs, the tables, um, all the furniture. And here I'm just showing you one that is um, the, the roof or let's say the acoustic panel that are trying to reduce the, um, the sound echo in a space. So the more geometry you have, the more you can absorb. But you also have to tune it to the space you are in. You don't do the same for each restaurant. So instead of developing a specific product for the specific place, um, what has been developed um, is an algorithm that is able to take the space and to be able to place complex panels, which are kind of uh, Norgin uh, origami geometries. And from this, being able to generate parametric model where all the joints and all the connection detail are already planned, produce it into CNC panels. So in this case, it's a laser cut uh, plywood, really thin plywood. And by the geometry, we give it more structures, but also more sound absorptions. Here, we are looking at uh, just one panel assembled from the other side. Now this is the connection detail to suspend it, and it will be hide behind. So all the project is open source and really easy to access. 
The idea here is that we use only things that are fabricated in the same area, the same neighborhoods, the materials, the, the, the machine, and the people. And they did the same approach for the food, for the dresses, and it's actually possible to do something. And the idea here is that the development that have been de done for this restaurant will not be rentable to do for each restaurant. But because it's open source, you can share this information, and many other restaurants can use it and produce with it. So now, in two days, we can make custom panels for any restaurant of the city. Not really that we want to make a business with this, but it would be possible. Looking at a bigger scale, uh, one project that uh, dates uh, back from 2010 uh, was to look at how we can produce in such a small lab like Fab Labs an uh, entire house. So this was the Fab Lab house that was proposed in the Solar Decathlon. It's a competition about the most efficient housings you could do um, in Madrid. And everything was produced with CNC uh, machines, one of them that I've shown you before. Um, and one of the ideas here, there's many others, was to look at how we can use um, this new freedom we have in shape to try to optimize the solar gain from the, from the house. So how much um, sun we can get uh, maximized onto the surface. So you see that it's covered with flexible panel, solar panel. And one of the algorithms was looking at how to change the shape to maximize the quantity of sun you can have. So the shape will be quite different if you are in Madrid, in Nairobi, or in Moscow, because the sun is quite different from one location to another one. So it was quite straightforward. We tried to optimize the best shape possible and then fabricate it as needed. Uh, I didn't put the slide with all the different things. One is thing that is important is that the whole algorithm and platform is then set up for adapting this shape into a constructive document with all the pieces that can be ready for CNC machining and assembly. So in theory, everybody can ask this house and then produce it in the rest of the world. It's a concept that is quite strong, and uh, people have been pushing it much further now. Uh, there's a wiki house, uh, I don't know if you know these people in London, that actually wish to see more building done by the citizen, more than actually uh, the big companies. So they believe that there's an alternative model of economy that could be built around these systems, not necessarily made of plywood and this uh, uh, complex system, or not necessarily so crazy shapes. You can do it with other means. But it's quite interesting that this could leverage new potentials. Other approach, uh, here we're looking at 3D printing with concrete. Um, so in this case, we're working with Enrico Dini and Axiona and trying to look at how these new technologies allow the new freedom of, shape, of space and shapes that was not possible before. Making a casting system for this bridge will be really impossible, or really costly, let's say. So what we are looking is how the freedom of shape could be used to, for example, for making a decorative pattern, if you want, but also to look at how we could optimize this uh, with structural analysis to reduce quite dram drastically the quantity of concrete you will put in your uh, building. So here was not maybe the best design we could have done, but the challenge was to make the first 3D printed bridge in um, uh, in a public space. So it's not so um, easy to fight against all the laws and all the regulations and get approvals. So that's why we had to multiply all the dimension by five. So finally, what we succeed to save in the design, we lost it in the execution. Nevertheless, it sees a potential. So that's why it's not the most elegant bridge we could have done. But there's potential for that. Another approach we're looking at um, 3D printing, there's many, many different processes. So the powder system is allowing really complex shapes and freedoms. And so you try to reduce the amount of material. Um, another type of um, 3D printing system uh, is looking at an extrusion based. So it's much more like this small machine, Ultimakers, that are depositing precisely only at a certain location. So you have less freedom of space, but you also have a freedom of designing what's happening inside the wall itself. So what's happening inside the wall, certainly I can design the infill, how my wall is working. And I can also really easily design the texture that is going outside. So here we're looking at how we can reduce the, um, not reduce, but optimize the energy relationship with the outside and the inside. My building can transpirate, can e uh, absorb heat. Um, and certainly the way you design the inside you can decide that this will, venti will connect really well with the outside temperatures or will be quite disconnected. So much more insulated, much more thermal mass or not. Um, so there's many designs that could be done. Another one is the textures could be set done in such a way that they're self-shading. So they absorb um, most of the heat on the external layers. And you can decide that this layer is actually really well ventilated. 
So actually, all this design freedom is not to be used only for shapes or for the shape of the shape, um, but also you can use it in more performative ways. And this could be combined with design, we believe, and could be much better integrated. So that's a bit like where we believe these are leading a bit. Um, but these are quite process that we can imagine is a bit scaling up all these machineries you see here that have been used into um, uh, other industry. So what we think is that maybe for the architecture and the scale of the cities, we have to rethink a bit which kind of material we are looking at, which kind of machinery we want to look at, which kind of process, and how we can deal with this. Um, basically, when you think about it in um, car industry or in mechanical engineering, the tolerance is 0 0.1 millimeters or 0 0.01 millimeters. When in construction, we are looking at something that even if it's five centimeter off, you can still continue to construct. That's quite classical, but because the dimensions are so big, the construction industry have been used to that. The machinery are not necessarily used to that, and therefore we might have to redesign them. Processes, there's thousands of processes we've been exploring. There's other ones uh, still to uh, be developing. Um, what is interesting is that um, here is not so much important the robot, uh, but but uh, what could be interesting is that we change everything that we attach to it. Now we can redesign each time on top of the robot which kind of tool I can put onto it. For example, one of the projects done by actually a Russian student in, uh, in IAC, Peter Novikov with Sasha, um, they've developed this uh, extrusion-based system um, that was trying to go beyond what could be done with 3D printing. I don't know if you know, 3D printing is generally layer by layers and have a problem of gravity. You cannot do any kind of shapes. Sometimes you're fighting against the gravity. And so what they wanted to do is to tune the machining process. And let's see if it works. Yes. Um, to tune the material process, um, so they choose a different type of material that drive really fast, thermosetting plastics, um, and combine it with a robot that will move really slowly, exactly at the speed of drying. This allows to suddenly don't have this problem of gravity, or at least a decent distance of a couple of meters. And as you can imagine, as designers, we are quite happy with such machines. So at least there is like no more problem of production, and you can make crazy ships. But actually, also for um, engineers, there's some interesting in uh, the way you slice an object. It's not necessarily um, the best way to have the properties in plan, but sometimes it's more ideal to have complex geometry. Well, it's been shortening that much short, better. Um, other weird project. Hmm. I don't know if I have to make play. This. Maybe you have to press play here somewhere. Um, is to look at different ways of producing um, subtractive manufacturing. So most of the pieces that we do are generally coming from flat elements that we cut out and then we assemble. Um, and so most of the digital process are actually starting from standard material and cut into flat elements. Sometimes we can work on more complex geometries and use CNC milling in uh, six axes. Or we can think about like more customized process for the type of material you put on the table. So instead of cutting the logs, peeling it off, making uh, plywood and then reassembling it into a beam that we can assemble. What we're proposing is like, why not coming back to the good old log house, but that instead of being stuck with like straight element, we choose the one of the most crazy shapes uh, that come out from the trees. You have to know that in Catalonia, um, we have a lot of trees, but they never grow really straight. There's a lot of wind, there's a lot of pendency, and around Mediterranean in general, our trees are not straight. So trying to make straight architecture out of curved logs is not the most efficient system. Um, so this was a, a tiny uh, workshop we uh, developed to look at how we could um, cut uh, these logs with a chainsaw that we mount on the robot. We're speaking about the chainsaw that maybe costs 100 euros, you buy at any shops, and you just mount it onto it, program, and start to look at how we can cut it. If someone is specialized in lock uh, assembly, he will criticize maybe many details. Um, but it worked out. It's quite interesting. Also, you have to understand that 
there's a, a kind of um, weird connection. Now I click on the video, I have to click outside. Uh, yep. There's a weird connection between the, um, the machine and the log. No? Something so complex um, and the machine that tends to be uh, always homogenized is not so easy. All the people that work in digital fabrication, they pre-plan everything and they don't adapt so much to the material you have. So if you have to readapt to each design, it's not each pieces is not easy. So we use 3D scanning and interpretation for that. And actually pushing a bit further, uh, we worked with industries that um, actually um, cut wood in Catalonia, uh, but only cut it for making pallets or to burn into a, a furnace. So um, what we're looking at is how they were making the pallets and how we could adapt this to construction. And they have a really nice trick that is actually they don't let the, machine, the wood dry. So when it dries, the wood tends to wrap because the fibers are not straight. No? It tends to wrap in all the direction. So what they do is they assemble the pallet before it dries, and then they dry it, and the pallet kind of keep in position because it's stuck into this position. So we use this same principle and try to use it into construction, have a robotic process that was able to take all of these uh, sticks. And I will have to click again. Thank you very much, super assistant. <laughs> um, so what we invent is kind of a simple process, well actually invent, we've been inspired by ETH Zurich to be honest. Uh, what we've done is to readapt it, oh, interesting, I have publicity now, only in Russia, i never seen how this in a... And um, what I've been um, tuned is to be able to handle, um, I think in this case, 10,000 sticks, all different. Um, and to cut them just at a specific measure to fit into a design. And the design itself take in consideration um, the problematics of this wood that want to paint and doesn't want to stay into position. So we had to attach it always in three different points to be sure that it doesn't move and that when you will try to move it will actually lock the whole structure. So the funny part of this is that actually the, the industrial collaborators uh, suddenly discovered that his wood was valuable for making things. So far he just asked us uh, kind of a log house in his garden, but uh, we hope that this can actually bring new hopes in Catalonia to use the wood in a different way than just pallets and burning it. Thanks. So this is quite important for us because this is the way we design normally. We go from one side, we have a wonderful idea, then we go into the engineering of it, we go into a code generation that is able for the machine to run it, and then we run it, and we expect that the shape that comes out is exactly what we design. And more we work with material, and I don't know if you had the chance to work with this kind of uh, CNC machines and 3D printing, and there is few probabilities that this happens the first time. And even after 10 years of experience, you know that there's always a challenge here. And so what they've done is try to make the machine and the material as perfect as possible, as, pl as predictable as possible, so that I can design everything before. That's maybe one of the aspects of doing this. But we believe that there is a potential to reintroduce more complex materials and more uh, difficult material into the loop. So 
one of the things we were looking before in Industry 4.0 is this idea of sensors and how we can connect it back. No? So one of the things we dream is that actually there can be a feedback loop between these two worlds. No? That there is actually a moment that I design, but there's also a moment where on the fabrication process there's something happening. When you think about it as a constructor or as a, an architect, when you ask a builder to make your building, you don't design all the details. The crafts or the constructors decide some detail on site and might adapt it while he builds it. And you ask him more or less a wall in this position, but finally, if the brick is like this or like this, it's not really always you deciding everything. And you have to share this knowledge and this, um, uh, how do you say, uh, this decision with many other people that have to take this decision. So it's not totally crazy to think that actually the robot could take part of this decision on site according to these elements. And this becomes quite important when we look at more crazy materials. No? So one thing that we've been looking at is a huge variety of materials. Here, I just pick a small selection of it. Um, so we've been looking at a bit of wood, a bit of adobe we'll look at after, uh, geopolymers. We are looking at biocomposites. Uh, there's also bioplastics. Some more weird things based on alg algae, uh, bacteria um, um, elements, or even graphene. I don't know if you heard about graphene, but it's a material that uh, promised to be quite interesting and it's been discovered just in 2012. Um, all based in carbon, so in theory, quite ecological. So just to pick one, um, maybe my favorite, um, well, not favorite, but the closest to market, maybe, um, this idea of using earth or adobe, the soil, into the materials of the construction. I don't know if you're aware, but actually more than 50% of the construction in the world are done still with adobe or with soil, not necessarily skyscrapers, maybe not in Moscow city, um, but we still have um, quite a lot of construction done in this manner. What we try to look at is if we could do this dream, I'm oh, sorry, I'll come back, uh, this dream of taking material directly on site and being able with some mix or additive specifically to be able to print directly the building. So this is what's happening normally with the construction in a soil-based uh, material or adobe. Um, but in this case, we want to look if it was possible to do this with 3D printing. So uh, the research started like back in 2011. Uh, we were looking at just printing with clay. Um, it's actually not so easy. You have to develop your own extruder. You have to see some many parameters and try to just printing a line seems to be actually a long mission. Designing the shapes that are able to not break also another mission, trying to understand all the particularity. Um, but from this, we start to be confident that it's possible to do something. And um, someone uh, the next year started to look into more what's happening at the material scale, and trying to redevelop the, its own material. And we discovered some research that actually additives uh, allows for a much more compact mix and being able to actually have a much stronger material. Um, so what we've done, we've done it was to look into like natural additives to be able to mix these things. So you could bring on site only this 1% of additives and the 99% of the material you can find it on site and try to improve the material. So the material in terms of strength, but also there's many uh, points that are really important for 3D printing. Uh, if the viscosity is good, if the drying period is good, water absorption, and one of the key aspects is the shrinkage, how an element will shrink or not. You don't maybe want to go into the detail, but this is kind of a creative process like architectures that, or urban design that you don't have all the hold over all the aspect of it and you have to try and fail many times till you get to some things. No? So you have a kind of a design process into the material. This said, uh, one of the researchers of Oakley succeeded to uh, find a mix that was up to three times stronger than uh, any documented uh, soil-based materials. Um, and this combined with structural shapes and design uh, with the printers suddenly reach really high level uh, of construction. We're not yet at the level of, of cement, but we're getting closer. And speaking with material scientists, now it's more than five years we continue this project, there's actually potential to go a step further, um, always a bit closer to concrete, and hopefully replace. What is important here is that to, as well, you have to design your own tools, your own process. Uh, here we find a system that was able to print a lot of different types of materials, and we still use this extruder developed uh, six years ago to print a huge variety of materials. We have more than 20 materials we've been printing with this one, and we're still researching many materials on it. One thing that we looked at, um, at the tooling itself, um, how we could implement this idea of sensors and sensor feedback. So here we're looking at uh, tiny sensors that could scan any issue and be able to correct it. Or um, more complex, uh, to have sensors about the environment and to be able to tune 
the process accordingly. I don't know if you know, but in the, the, the clay craftsmanship is actually a quite a complex thing, and that's why you've been disregarded in many construction sites. Uh, you need to have a knowledge of understanding how the material is, the viscosity that you have, but also the climate, if it's dry or humid, if it's hot or cold. You don't do the same mix, you don't do the same wall, and you don't make the same thickness of uh, elements. So you have to understand this uh, materiality. And there's a sense that humans have a lot, robot doesn't have at all, so you have to add a lot of sensors to try to get these things. No? And it's a bit of uh, knowledge that a bit lost with times. No? Today we devaluize, devaluize hmm. but so down the value of being a craft, that I don't know how many friends of you are actually craftsmen in a construction site, but in France it's really disregard. It's not chic to go to a girl and to say, hey, I'm a craft of the construction site. Well, if you say it's an architect, oh, yeah, well, it's much better. I don't know how is it in Moscow, but I believe it's not so different. Um, while the plumber is winning much more money than I do. Clearly, there's no doubt about this. And you have much more job and more, more things to do and actually make maybe a better impact than I do in my construction. So um, we have to rethink about this. But this is a fact. We lack good craftsmen in the site and the quality have been going down. So what we hope is that the robots can bring back this knowledge and this craft. Um, so maybe we, I don't want to go too much in detail, um, but we are starting to develop, and this is not finished yet, it's something that we are pushing for uh, next year, but it's extruders that are able to change the mix while it's printing. So you can have gradients of material from a place that is really hard to a place that is really soft, or not soft, but lightweight. So you don't necessarily need the whole building to be made of the same materials, and you can have variety of it. I don't know if you know how it's a section of a bone, for example, but you have quite a different materiality. But you could also adapt it to this sensor. Well, there's many details. I don't want to go too much in this. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, a last technical layer, and then I finish. Um, what is really interesting is that when you give to a robot sensors and decision possibilities, so you can analyze what's happening after, and you can feel how is the space before, you can let him decide what's the best thing to do. For us, it seems to be trivial, but in the machine, it's not so easy. And it happens that we have a lot of changes happening these past years of machine learning becoming more and more available to designers, to industries. Um, 10 years ago, it was a luxe. Today, it's quite easy. You could, we could invite here, I'm sure, in a workshop, and in one week, you will have five people making machine learning. It's not a, such a big problem. And actually, that's a big change, because we can handle all this complexity of sensors and data and information and what kind of material I can do and let the robot work for a year testing thousands of different mixes and processes and things and on top of that he will not do it only for himself but he will share with all the robots of the planet. There's no problem of keeping this information. So machine learning is quite changing a lot of handling this complexity. Okay, stop with technique. Um, more fancy, the robot itself. So one thing that is quite interesting is that um, we always see uh, robots, maybe humanoids or industrials. Um, but actually, there's many other ones that are cute in a way, but also uh, spread new possibilities. So one of the things we've been interested in is the cable robots. Um, when you look at how 3D printer works, it's quite difficult to scale it up to really big scale. Uh, when you think that you have to make a bridge that hang over 20 meters to be able to print a house that make 15 meters, for example, it's quite difficult. Um, when one thing we discover is that the cable robot doesn't have these limitations. Um, they are quite really efficient in being at large scale with a lot of weight. So they can, this one can handle up to 500 kilograms. We're speaking about something that can uh, span over 16 meters by 11 meters by 6 meters. So it's not a small scale of machinery. Within these boundaries, you can still keep a precision of the order of the millimeter. Approx. So what we've done actually is to contact um, this uh, group of research uh, at Technalia uh, that have been for more than 10 years trying to scale up this technology and to implement it into industry. So it's one of the most, uh, um, it's the first product that actually is going to industry this year. Um, there was not, uh, um, we say, fitting all the regulation before. Um, and so uh, what we've done is to come with the extruders and to try to tune the machine to be able to 3D print with it. And strangely, us designers that are not mechanical engineers or uh, uh, software designers, we were able to control, take control of the machines and to be able to code our particular way of working. They was using it, this machine just to pick and place pallets, again pallets. 
So also one of the key aspects is that this machine is quite flexible. If you push it, it will move. It's just cable suspended. So you cannot go really hard with the design. You cannot make straight angle. Everything has to be soft and smooth. So it's not just by design that we wanted to have it rounded. It's also because it's needed. And actually speaking with a the technician, there is no theoretical limits to scale this up to 200 meters or 500 meters if you want. This is what they use in the stadiums to make cameras uh, floating over um, um, the stage to film the um, uh, football or rugby. Um, and so they know that this technology is possible to scale at really large dimension. And the weight as well, it just depends on the section of your cables. You could have as much weight as you want. So it might be this uh, seen in more construction side than we expect. Um, and actually, one of the things that we haven't tested when we went to their industry to mount it is actually to dismantle the whole uh, piece and to be able to install it on site. So what we've done actually is to um, is to rent um, a structure of aluminium and just move the motors to assemble and to be able to print in a construction fair. So here we had only 10 days, actually 15 days, of which nine days for printing two for installing, one for dismantling, and to be able to make this project. And actually, it was such a challenge to print at big scale that what we're using is not um, us to measure or, sc or scan, but we use drones to be able to measure constantly how we were doing the things. So imagine that while you're working, you always have a camera watching you and telling you, you're going good, but it's a bit like kind of um, a supervisor. And so this was allowing us to have as much data as possible. Thank you. With the project of phone site robotics, we want to rethink the process uh, of construction from the very first moment of the extraction of the material to the very last moment of uh, construction, performance of the building, and of course the design of it. By constructing with 3D printing, we can introduce new materials. By new material, we believe that sustainable materials such as earth are something that could be reintroduced into architecture. The actual design that we present here are actually showing how a wall could be much more intelligent in the way we distribute the matter and how it can perform under really good insulators at the same time as a pattern that could self-shade itself. The role of our drones in the project of on-site robotics is about monitoring the fabrication process, providing data related to the uh, quality of the clay and related to the hardening of the material in order to understand how much we can grow during time without collapsing the structure. Collero is based on the cable robotics technology. It is very suitable uh, to optimize automated operation in large uh, workspaces. The technology is very transversal, so it's very uh, versatile, so it can be used in different uh, sectors uh, for performing different, different tasks. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but actually during the whole operation, there was actually someone with a small uh, comment, no? And actually this is the key of the whole project. We sell that it's all robotics and made by, by the machines and the, everything is tuned. There's a uh, drone that is going around. But the truth is that actually um, we are still the best people to measure, to feel things and to take decisions. And uh, one of the key aspects of this is that actually we always, in all the projects you've seen, there was always someone to tune the process, to adjust the speed, to put a new log, or actually it's not the robot from one side. This is what we call a human-machine collaboration. And for now, in all these projects you've seen, it's quite rudimentary. So there's need for more. Um, 
what we hope is to go into, a bit into this, this world where there will be a bit of synergy between these digital layers, this kind of robotic fabrication, but also people still being around to make the craft. And all the projects that you've seen, generally there's someone to be finishing, to send a bit, to adjust the things. And this is the best skill that we could imagine, is one of the people. So we hope that we'll get into this kind of digital craft. Um, Ah, forget this one. Uh, another small project that we like about robots, um, developed still by this amazing uh, Russian uh, student we had that became actually faculty in this case. Um, that was Peter uh, that developed this. Uh, what a place is good. Um, that developed these mini builders. Um, that was a set with together with uh, a team of um, ten people. Uh, they developed these mini robots um, that was trying to challenge this idea of like really big machine to make big architectures and who have the biggest one but say no no with tiny one we can actually uh, make um, um, large structures um, this is quite inspired by nature i don't know if you've seen how it works bees or uh, ants but clearly they're bringing much bigger than themselves and this really is quite a lot of potentials in this case, we have one that is on the ground making the first layers. Then we have this uh, really nice robot that creep onto the previous one. And just by adjusting the way the head is printing, can decide to go more left or right and start to define different shapes. Um, so in this case, opening the, these structures or closing it. And then we had this last uh, robot that was able to add new layers on the structure. It's not evident to make this slide, you can imagine. Um, actually, all this project is open source. You could download all the files and buy your own for a thousand euros. Um, to be honest, they're not really ready for production. It's really experimental in this case. Um, but with time, we hope that sensors will get much cheaper um, and machine learning will become quite useful and easy to integrate. So it might be possible that while we're constructing with our hands or traditionally, we might have other robots crawling around us and actually adding new layers of constructions. So we believe there will be quite a potential on this. Another things before. Yes, I wanted to. I just added this last slide uh, at the last minute. Um, so more than trying to look only at the potential of what could be done in terms of performance, as the most cheapest building or the most efficient ones, um, we believe there's also potential for a bit more creative uh, aspects with the robots. Um, and one of the things that we had the chance to do uh, was uh, with Tony Kumeya um, to develop a facade for buildings that was uh, inspired by uh, music. And I will ask you to click, sorry. Ah, to the next one. Not this one, next. Yeah, this one. We wanted a building that would give certain distance between what was happening outside and what was happening inside. In order to choose a material to design those vertical blinds, we thought that the best, perhaps, was to use a material that was a constant in the Catalan design, and for that, we chose ceramic. So maybe all the pieces um, to be the same. One thing that we is important want, here actually, is that um, well, the video is a bit long, so maybe we will not watch all of it. Uh, but one thing that is quite important time, is this the fact that we are in a traditional uh, construction that. company that is making so tile for more than 150 that. years that have been evolving this technology with times, um, and they've been always passionate about developing projects, uh, product for each project. So they have a totally flexible way of producing, where they readapt their extrusion process or their spraying process or their carving process to each of the things. And actually, we succeed after some years to convince him that he should try with some robots um, to start to tune each of the pieces um, to, um, to the facade. So actually, there's not one piece that is equal, and the robot is actually engraving on the surface um, 
a pattern for each different tiles. And these patterns, instead of being designed by hands, that could have been done actually designed by hands, uh, I'm sorry to put myself on the video, I shouldn't. Um, not really what I want, but I didn't have editor, uh, video editing. But what is interesting is um, that actually with a simple process like this one, it's just carving, and it's actually something we, it's, we get inspired by hand, um, we define a, a pattern that was extracted from um, the music. One of the big advantages of using robotic fabrication uh, inside this process. I'm waiting for the slide, and then we can pass. We're able to make all the tiles different. Each tile is unique and represents a certain time inside the music. On the finished pieces, we could clearly read on the left side the high frequency and on the right side the low frequency. And when you listen clearly Vivaldi sounds, there's a huge change according to the music towards low and high frequency that is easy to read. So we can clearly vinculate and connect the image with the sound. Me interessa molt aquesta barreja de manualitat a tecnologia, aquesta artesania avançada que m'agrada parlar d'artesania avançada, que et pugui servir per per avançar sobre procediments de tota la vida, però amb llenguatges nous. It's difficult to see now with the with the light. But so basically for us, that was kind of um, the key moment where we succeed to convince someone that are deep into industries and crafts that actually they could transfer part of the knowledge or part of the imagination into such a machinery. You know? And so that they could be like combining this, this two worlds. So for us, it doesn't look like complex machine and other complex programming, but this is what we like. It reveals new things in each of this uh, project. Well, I think the video is quite long. So, just to continue on this person, I think this is the way um, most of the industry are moving. He actually designed all the tooling that are inside his companies. Uh, he designed his oven, he designed uh, the uh, extrusion process, the die of the extrusion process. Um, and what you do is never to do the same piece in a project. You always re reinvent the whole process. Definitely the material or ideas are shared, uh, but he reorganizes uh, his uh, production line to each project. And what is interested is this technology, the flexibility that they offer, will push it in this direction. And what's happening is that big companies are slowly moving into this position where they can rearrange all the time. to say the music is a four season by Vivaldi recomposed by Max Richter, one of my favorites. Just one thing, um, so we discovered that actually a lot of industries are asking us more of this, uh, more innovations, uh, more craziness, how you can combine um, crafts, design, engineering, and uh, we've been pushed to make these new masters uh, that try to bridge a bit the world of um, uh, industries, academia, um, in the same approach that we've been doing so far. And what is interesting um, is that actually, um, 
we we do have a lot of architects and a lot of designers that are willing to join these masters. We have a lot of industries that are actually willing to see this, but the real people that are coming from the industries, the, from the industry, from the engineer uh, field that normally into this fabrication are still the one lacking to join the field. They don't see the potential that we are proposing. Here. Um, so one of the aspects we are looking here is how we can share more easily knowledge and ideas and how this vision that some of us have could be spread over university. So if you have some uh, uh, colleagues that want to go in this direction, we'll be happy to, uh, to push a bit. Uh, but just to uh, quickly summarize, um, we believe in these structures that is like to look at materials, uh, how to materialize with machines, how this will be influenced by data and how we work with this, and how at the end we have to understand that machine will not do everything and how human can we get back to it. No? So how we intertwine these two worlds. So I hope that I can come back maybe in two years and show you a bit more of this uh, interaction between human and machines uh, and have this uh, working well. So that's a bit the challenge we are working on and we hope that will not be the only one. I hope that there is some similar programs or ideas that will emerge also in uh, Moscow on the rest of the world. Together is better than alone. Uh, with this, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, hey, folks, uh, just ask your questions, but I'm going to ask you to use the microphone because we're online and anything out of the microphone doesn't go online. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you. <laughs> One, two. Thank you for the lecture. Um, as we are here uh, in the Graduate School of Urbanism and here in the lab we are more connected with urban scale also. We are starting from this uh, robotics and uh, more construction things, but uh, the topic which we are more interested in this is urban scale. And you were mentioning that uh, you are also thinking about how these projects can be uh, can have scale, urban scale and be connected. So. Um, how do you think, in what, which perspective that will be possible that the mass construction which you have here, which has um, less using less robotics, will be on the scale of city and can be used in a city environment like everywhere and will be widespread? What what kind of perspective is this? Like five years, ten years, or maybe even less or even more? Um, maybe I want to just do a video then. Can you play this one? Just one minute more and then uh, um, just maybe to speak about the fact that building are not necessarily have to be think about something forever here. Uh, and actually most of our building are getting destroyed after 50 years or even less. And that is something that grows and that the video are not playing. No? Well, it's not so important. I will, uh, I will show, uh, explain this better. Um, one thing that is quite key in the material we've been developing, for example, um, is that it's recyclable. It's not something that um, actually we throw away. Concrete, today, we just grind it back into granules and we put it into uh, landfills. We just throw it around um, and we don't uh, really recycle our buildings. Retrofitting is still something difficult and uh, requires a lot of hands and a lot of people and is absolutely not fitting in this mass production system uh, that we are planning because each Building is different and need to be reinterpreted.
actually this was a promotion video we used last month um, but it's just to show you that actually now we can be um, not afraid of destroying our own building and to uh, push it uh, further and maybe we have to rethink um, the building process not as something static or definitive but something that we have to keep evolving so maybe in cities we have to imagine that the um, um, the building are always renovated and move over and they will be constructed on top of each other they will rehabilitate from inside they might be destroyed and recycled and printed again um, and what we hope is that actually by bringing uh, robotic fabrications and more advances in materials we can also rethink the way um, building are imagined and integrated into their urban fabrics today when we build a city it's quite difficult to know what will happen in 50 years now we know that the evolution of car in the way we distribute the city it was a good guess from uh, uh, Cerda in, uh, in Barcelona with a grid but he didn't use that um, but uh, now we have Americans that went all the way to car and they discover oh no pedestrian was better and so we can see in Dubai every 10 years the urban is changing from one position to another one but they cannot readapt the whole city they have to construct another area or another construction on the side um, so while it's really nice to visit it as an experiment, um, I believe that the quantity of cement that they have to throw away and that actually will collapse at one point because people will not will to live in these cities um, is quite dramatic. So if we could use these techniques to have more renewable cities that can adapt all the times and change, that would be quite interesting. So I think that could be quite a nice link uh, between these two worlds. Well, I hope so. Uh, a last one maybe uh, to think about is that some people move to uh, actually the same Peters that have been working uh, a lot on this robotics. Um, they've developed their own um, kind of startup company in San Francisco where they try to look at spaces that adapt and change robotically. So it means that actually um, now we could have like um, a place where we could sit on it that have been constructed by robots that dismantle it the same robot and construct a separation wall between these two spaces. So hopefully something. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't knew it was so hot in Moscow. <laughs> um, so there, there is quite potential as well to rethink uh, spaces in a more dynamic way. Come on. Sure. But please use the microphone. Thank you for a lecture. It was very interesting. And uh, second question in case, because uh, Architectural Association in London is doing pretty much the same thing with what you is doing, right? So uh, from your point of view, what is the difference between your university and Architectural Association in London? Do you know? Uh, which one, sorry? The? Architectural Association in London. Ah, in London? Yeah. Um, Probably hmm. not. I think it's, um, we are a set of universities that try to push uh, the boundaries and I don't feel myself as a competitor of them. I think that we're all pushing in slightly different directions um, and actually we enrich each other uh, thinking. Uh, so we actually invite each other quite often uh, to presentations and the lectures. Um, and we believe that uh, each one is pushing a bit in slightly different directions. Uh, if you look at AADRL, for example, uh, they look at uh, this uh, crazy robotics, um, how do you say, uh, self-assembly robotics, um, that in our case we never really pushed further, uh, and we looked more at the material itself. Now they, we develop our own materials, while AADRL didn't uh, develop their own materials. Uh, but it's not why they will not change. Maybe next year they will develop their own material and they will start to make self-assembly robots. Um, I think it's different research lines and the same world uh, where we can learn from each other. Um, and there's also different scale of um, impact on the, on the architectures. Uh, Sometimes we are getting closer us from industries and from actually making it uh, happen hopefully in five to ten years, while maybe sometime AADRL is looking at 20 to 50 years uh, scale, um, but that's also quite interesting to look at. So um, I'm, I'm quite glad that created all this diversity of people looking at, uh, uh, at these projects and uh, looking at the potential of it for, in the, really in the case of AD London, is really about looking at what's the impact as an architect and designers. Um, well, maybe we slightly move to a more multi multidisciplinary approach. Maybe, but. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And the second question, if you have have you heard about a printed house here in Russia? It's pretty much a small house, circle house, uh, mm -hmm. but it's quite 
famous because of this project is selling the machine worldwide. So what do you think from technological point of view about this? Um, so one thing that is quite interesting is that 3D printing in architecture have been like uh, prophetized uh, already in 95, I think, by uh, Bregovic and uh, um, this idea of contour crafting, um, and we're clearly inspired by this. Uh, we always love this, these ideas. Um, and it's quite interesting to see that now in China, in uh, Russia, and a bit everywhere, there's um, uh, bubbles of intents of making it happening. Um, what is a bit strange or something where a bit... Uh, not so happy with it is that what they propose as architecture with these uh, tools is actually the same architectures, maybe faster, maybe cheaper, um, but they're not like proposing new paradigm into why we use it and why it's so interesting to. And we don't believe that the interest lies only in the economics of it, maybe, but we believe that um, it lies in this new potential that they offer and this new connection with design, this new connection with materials. So to print, so to reinvent a new process to use exactly the same materials that we criticize, concrete, okay, we save a bit of formwork, so that's good, a bit less waste on the construction side, but still concrete I would avoid, if I can. Uh, so I'm happy to try to use this excuse of new technology to actually change the whole process from the material to the design to actually how we use the building and how we recycle it. That's a bit the hope of integrating all this logics into common projects. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, it's quite clear, but it's quite a long way ahead of us. Right? And that's what is passionating when you think that the concrete was invented 100 years ago, or reinforced concrete uh, was uh, actually put in practice 100, 150 years ago, right. and that still there is a lot of research going on into yeah. making it most amazing structures. Uh, I think we have still a lot of uh, paths in front of us, yeah. and okay. it's quite interesting. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, and I have a more of a philosophical question. Uh, you were talking about the fourth um, industrial revolution. And as I heard, uh, we are heading towards a horizontal society that is based uh, on the connections. <laughs> and that the um, hierarchy to know uh, it it um, uh, that we are um, heading towards the world that is uh, free of centers uh, and yeah because uh, you were you were saying that I'm sorry uh, just uh, that uh, do you see cities in the future, or it's more like it's it's one material of people? Thank you. Um, so yes, I would love that technology will bring this idea of totally decentralized uh, hierarchy. Um, that's another talk. I don't pretend this in this one. Um, I still hope that this will happen. Maybe you were referring to the uh, Fab City research that is trying to propose this idea of city that uh, doesn't have to share, um, uh, let's say, to travel all the matter around the world. Uh, we still believe in this for two reasons. Is one that your needs are really specific and you don't necessarily need the, the same needs as someone on the other side of the planet and you should be proud of it and therefore ask your local people to produce not the king burger that you can find in New York but a special burger that is Moscovite or actually not a burger but another culture. We're not getting influenced by everyone but I think it's interesting to adapt to what you have uh, locally and what we hope is that this will drive to effectively decentralized systems where we don't uh, look at the homogeneity of the world, but the diversity of the world. So we hope that technology will help us to go in this direction. So instead of trying to be homogenized, that we have this diversity going on. Nevertheless, we are on a small world, small planet, and we travel so easily now that we are super connected. And not only about data, but also us physically. It's so easy to travel, apart when we have problem of visa. Um, but uh, I hope that we will be effectively one um, how to say, uh, that we share the same uh, vessel in space and therefore we have to help each other and so there's connection. But still, we need our diversity. I don't know if I answer your question. Okay. Escape it from the philosophy. Oh, this one.
thank you very much for the lecture. It was very impressive. Uh, I mean, all these um, things uh, we have, haven't uh, even thought about, I think, uh, five or ten years ago. Uh, what uh, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, your position in architecture. Uh, do you think which uh, which approach to preservation of uh, the uh, urban context and uh, the architectural context uh, is better, uh, creating something new and uh, recycling it uh, every 10 years, or uh, just uh, preserving the existing buildings and existing um, maybe communities, uh, but just uh, rethinking their uh, functional and their um, their functions and their uh, ideas. What do you think is uh, like better for preservation of uh, the narrative of the place and uh, of, uh, in terms of um, preserving the resources and the materials? Thank you. Um, it's quite, um, I would love to say you A or B, but I don't have the, I think it would be a bit of both. Um, when you think making a building into a position or into a place is quite a lot of energy. So even if you recycle the materials, it's still a waste of energy to try to demolish it and to construct it again. Still today, there's a big question. No? When you have a building, if you have to uh, refurbish it or demolish it and construct a new one, they question itself. No, um, Maybe there will be in between. We can demolish a part and recycle, but it's also the way you built your constructions. Um, there was a lot of movement into uh, making really uh, strong structures that are flexible enough to handle uh, uh, habitat as the same as office, as the same as public space, in the same structure, and then the envelope and maybe this partition inside could be thrown away and put it back. Did this building really succeed to move forward? In part, yes. Uh, so the problem is that uh, most of the people um, doesn't want so much to invest in the future. Um, often the investors sell the, the, the building and then disappear and doesn't care so much about how much you put money at that. You have to be the little possible, sell it the highest price and then that it become trash after 20 years is not such a, a problem. So maybe in this case it's quite difficult to predict what will happen in 50 years and therefore you should be able to at least construct with recyclable materials if possible with a reusable structure. So that will be the best of both, uh, imagine. But uh, just to look again at these robots, that's why we dream so much about the, these small ones, is because we believe for rehabilitation, that is a good part of the job we need to do in uh, Europe, uh, it could be more efficient. This is a bit where we're positioned. But uh, I like the idea that you also question, um, should we respect the architecture itself or the, 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 the building, uh, historical building and cultural heritage? Um, I think in this case, uh, the way you do it is also important. So when you restore it, you don't want to put a robot where before there was people making with hands. Um, that's the whole question in restorations. Uh, we actually work a lot with uh, people that are uh, restorator of the modern um, architectures in Barcelona. And they are so good into materials because at this time, there were so many crazy ideas that the restorator have to reverse engineer the architect that was crazy, and on top of that, see the problems that the building have suffered in the past hundred years. So now they became even more specialists because they have to understand the material and see how it suffered over hundred years. And this is thanks to these people that we can develop new uh, materials. So there's a bit of mix there uh, that is quite interesting. And I think with this we close the party. Thank you very much for lecture. And let's make applause. Thank you. Guys, we are looking forward to see you in the next lectures as well. So, and thank you, Alexander.
guess I'm trying to say